Thank you, Lord. Okay, we are on olives. And as we know, let's do this just for good measure. Let's get back into uh, Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy verse 7 and 8 and chapter 8. This is the last teaching on olives. <clears throat> now, beloved, there are a lot more scriptures, examples, uh, and fruit. Rather, the way the Lord put it to me is there is more fruit to be bore from this tree. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about today about what an olive is. Now, we know olives are one of the seven species. And again, Deuteronomy 8, 7 and 8, and it reads, A land of wheat and barley vines and fig trees, pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. When we are beginning to examine this scripture, why, you know, food is such a big part of our life. Show me a man and I'll show you that he eats food. And there's no man who doesn't eat food, unless they're fasting, but that's for a time. You can fast for hours or days for medical reasons or spiritual reasons. And other than that, you return back to, uh, you know, they used to call it three hots and a cot, three meals and a place to rest. You need this. Everybody needs this. What you eat, where you rest, that changes. The fact that you eat does not change. Most people eat several times a day. Uh, when I was overseas, I met guys that ate one meal a day, but the meal it was literally like a bowl like this. Uh, and other people have a bunch of small meals. You know, it depends on what they believe about diet. But one thing it has in common with every human that ever was and will be is they eat food. They're carnivores or they're omnivores or they're herbivores. It's by choice. There's many diets nowadays in our culture. Uh, and some of them are, again, spiritual, like in the Bible. Uh, I want you to know that Adam and Eve had a covenant with God and they had a diet that went with the covenant. Noah had a covenant with God, and he had a diet to go with the covenant. Moses had a covenant with God and a diet to go with the covenant. And in Yeshua and Jesus, we have a new covenant, and there's a new diet. So food's a big part. So olives are a part of our food. Now, we know about olives. They're huge. Here we have uh, pure what's called beaten olive oil. Uh, and here is, uh, again, this is a, a vase that they found in Israel, 2,500 years old, that says for the koenim, uh, so it would say something, for example, the koenim uh, in Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, uh, and, and for the, the priests in Jerusalem, this is what would carry olive oil. So what you're seeing here is a 21st century vessel that's still, you know, nowadays they keep them in glass bottles that are dark colored, and that's to prevent the light from uh, changing the composition of the oil. But this is an old vessel. Same cork still would be used. Uh, but anyway, old and, old and new vessels, beautiful. Earthen vessels, both of them are made out of, uh, this is made out of clay, and this one's made out of sand. So uh, beautiful, beautiful way to carry olive oil. And again, here is a, uh, an olive tree that you're seeing. This is actually a wreath. We've turned it into a wreath. But this is uh, olives, and they're green, and they are black and they are maroon. There's, there's several uh, species here on the olive tree. But as we're looking at the olives, we want to know, besides food, what is it good for? And we know olives are good for to eat. You can make olive everything, olive tapenade. As a matter of fact, we made olive bread today, olive challah. And um, the olive oil, again, go to your favorite Italian restaurant, and it's everywhere on the table in most cooking recipes. Uh, and there's different types of oil now, but in the old world, uh, there was pretty much only olive oil. Um, what I want to show you today, and another thing I want to draw your attention to is do we have an Olympics. Every, uh, in every country, every culture, and every several years, there's a big Olympics. And in the old days, the Olympics was, re the, uh, rather the Olympians, the Olympic athletes, were rewarded with a... Uh, a wreath of olive leaves. Now that was, that had uh, Roman Greco ties to Roman Greco deities, um, of course, which is false and they've all come to an end. Uh, but it's interesting that they chose, of all things, to showcase deity uh, with an olive branch or an olive tree or a fruit of the olive. Now, 
I want to tell you about today. Again, I want you to look at this and just see. It's li this is like a golden light. Uh, light can go through it. Obviously, it's transparent, but it's golden in nature. And this is whether you rub it on your skin, put it in your uh, hair. It actually has healing properties. And as we learned last week, many of the New Testament saints uh, were commanded, of course we are, to get olive oil and to anoint it, anoint the sick. Matter of fact, I have a little vial right here uh, of oil that you're supposed to pray. And this is uh, in James, the book of James. Pray, is anyone amongst you sick? Pray, anointing them with oil in the prayer of faith. Uh, shall heal them. And so uh, some people are able to use oil as, as a perfume. They're able to use it for uh, massage therapy and medical things and such like this, uh, cooking. It has many uh, applications, but I want you to know also that oil can be burned. Uh, <clears throat> suppose I take this here and I take off the cork and I put in there a wick and I light the wick, it will lamp. This is now what you have would be a first century version of a lamp or the menorah. The menorah is an oil burning. Uh, they call it a candelabra, but the, the candles were not invented till the fifth century. So uh, they only burned olive oil in the temple. And in today, real menorahs uh, should lean towards uh, burning olive oil. Uh, let's show this. So I want to show you a few scriptures about what the olive tree is. Now, remember, we showed you pictures from the olive garden, uh, the garden of Gethsemane of olive trees that were 2000 years old still bearing fruit, and still able to be grafted into. What does that mean, grafted into? That means you take a, tr a, a branch from here and you just pick it off. Let's say here's our olive tree, okay? And you sharpen it, or you cut angle on one side, and you stick that in, and all of a sudden, several weeks later, it heals like, like your body would heal. There's a big scar, uh, kind of like a... Uh, amalgamation or protrusion of bark and it actually receives it and this now can bear fruit from this tree and in Romans is an example of when we have been called in Christ Jesus to we, we've been grafted into the tree of Israel which remember was grafted into God by faith and friendship through Avroem Abraham let's go to Psalm 52 8 Psalm 52 8 now remember in the promised land is is you know, you go on vacation and it has your favorite food uh, or you go on a trip or you have a birthday party and they have special food that is specifically to bless you, to make you happy, to make you fat uh, or, or whole or full as you would call it. And remember that the promised land is no different. There's going to be, uh, you know, milk, honey, vines, figs, wheat, barley, all of these wonderful, fruitful, healthy, organic paradise food, foods, and olives were one of those. Now, olives are great. They don't need a lot of water. Their bark uh, is uh, uh, very strong. The olive tree is so hard. Matter of fact, the temple doors, okay, to the vestibule in the Temple of Solomon were made out of solid olive wood. And uh, in, the, in the tabernacle, you had the Ark of the Covenant, and in the Temple of Solomon, above the Ark, you had two cherubs that were the size of this room. Imagine your living room if you have a house uh, or if you have an uh, apartment. Imagine the visitor center. Uh, imagine about 18 cubits high, and each cubit is almost two feet. So you can imagine these over 20-foot angels touching one wing to one wall. The other wing is touching the wing of an angel. That wing is touching the angel's wing, the other wing is touching the wall, and they're towering over the Ark of the Covenant uh, like guardians, if you will. And those were also made out of gold-covered uh, solid olive wood. So uh, olive wood is also very expensive. You'll find olive wood today in cutting boards and little dishes. Uh, you, can, you can find olive wood bowls. Uh, some of them for a little four-inch bowl, it's like 40 bucks. So... Uh, this is very expensive, and they're beautiful. If you go to Jerusalem, you will find a nativity carved out of olive wood, Noah's Ark carved out of olive wood, anything you can imagine carved out of olive wood as souvenirs, communion cups and so forth. It's beautiful wood. Psalm 52, 8. So let's talk about you can use an olive tree for building as well, uh, building furniture, building uh, specialty items, but there's a lot to be said that Remember these seven species, there's, not, there's no waste here. When you have an olive tree, 
You can use the wood to build anything you want, uh, a structure, the house of God door, uh, a structure, you use the leaves um, for medicinal purposes, you use the olives to eat and to make olive oil, and that olive oil turns on the lights in the house uh, and anoints you to be healed. And there's, there's really such wisdom in planting a tree like this, a self-sustainable agricultural entity uh, in the promised land and then teaching the people how to use it to derive its uh, fruit. Psalm 52, 8, and it reads, But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the love of God forever and ever. What is a green olive tree? Well, it's fragile, but it's fertile. It's just beginning. Now remember, if an olive tree can last over 2,000 years, how precious is this little baby? Um, you know, olive trees can outlast us by like 20 lifetimes, okay? So you see a little baby olive tree, that's a big deal. So. Here, the choir master, a mascal of David, um, he's basically saying here that I am like this little work that's going to go on and on and on. And what is he going to go on to? He is going to go on to trust in the love of God forever and ever. Because there's one thing that's older than an olive tree. You want to guess what it is? The love of God. Amen. It's immovable. Amen. You can trust in it, lean on it. Uh, it, out, will, it will outlast your entire family. Uh, the word of God endures forever, and the love of God, God is love, uh, is without end. Amen? Let's look at Revelation 11.4. Now, again, as we are learning, uh, you know, I keep referencing that if you would have been brought up in the promised land, uh, you would have seen all of this stuff. That would be like in our culture if I say, where's a Walmart? Not what's a Walmart, where's a Walmart? Why? Because... We already know what they are, where they are. They are everywhere. Walmarts are everywhere. There's several in each, each uh, city. And uh, it's not what are they, it's where are they. In the same way, olive trees in Jerusalem would have been everywhere. Palm trees, uh, pomegranate trees, vineyards filled with grapes, uh, barley, barley fields, barley uh, stalks. This is all over. Figs, fig trees. Amazing, right? What a fruitful expression of God's faithfulness. Let's go to Revelation 11.4. There are two, um, rather, these are the two olive trees. Now, this is really amazing. We're going to tie Old Testament and New Testament together here in a prophecy. Uh, the Lord is now speaking. There are two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Okay. These are the two. What's the two olive trees? Well, let's look above there. Let's go to verse 3 and 2 and 1. This is like some level of forensic discovery. When I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. By the way, this is in heaven. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations." And they will trample the holy city for 42 months, and I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees. Okay, so the reference here in Revelation is actually referencing some very famous word. Turn with me to Zechariah. Let's go to Zechariah 4. Now, do you notice how he said the temple in heaven? Uh, he's giving clout to the reality. He is calling us to understand, to focus. Uh, but he's, he's giving attention to the fact that there's a temple in heaven. Why is that temple in heaven connected to the two witnesses? Uh, well, in the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, okay? Zechariah 4, what's happening chronologically is we are somewhere in the area of 444 B.C. Now, we know during the diaspora, when we were dispersed, uh, we, we went to the, the nations. You'd find Jews in Germany. Uh, you would find Jews in Poland, in, in Switzerland, Ireland, in Spain. There was a massive Jewish population in Spain. Uh, they called them Sephardic Jews. And the German and northern uh, Italy uh, you know, in Northern Europe, 
and uh, you know Poland, Sweden, all these things they called Ashkenazi Jews or Ashkena Jews, and uh, these are the two major types of Jews that were uh, in the kingdom during that time of the diaspora. Now, why were we dispersed? We were dispersed because in 70 A.D., obviously Nero and Titus destroyed uh, the temple and. Uh, all of Jerusalem was given under their authority. Now, this happened once before uh, in 586 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar as you know him, uh, came and ransacked all of Jerusalem uh, again and destroyed it. So now we have the story of, Ab of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which is really Hanani, Azariah, and Mishael. In the fire, we have the book of Daniel, and um, they are in Babylon for 70 years. Why 70 years? It says literally because they violated the land not to keep the Sabbath of God for uh, 49 years. Well, one Sabbath every, every seven days, which means one year out of every seven, which means if uh, 400, I'm sorry, I said 49, 490 years of dishonoring God and disobeying his Sabbath would result in a timeout of 70 years. Now, why would God do something like that? Why would you put your child in timeout so that they learn? Learn what? What is good, what is blessed, what is proper and appropriate, right? Well, God, we are made in the image of God, so if we do that, we had to get that from somewhere. Uh, and beloved, it comes from God. Out of God's love for us, he is always teaching us and training us on what will really answer our prayers, will truly make us happy. Uh, and in this case, in our culture, I'll just give you an example, just a little, uh, I want you to get a vision of this. In our culture, people just want to take the edge off. So they have a brew or a glass of wine, whatever it is, uh, or they just need a massage or they just want a moment of peace. If I could just get, and we're seeking, all we're searching and seeking for that internal rest. Well, God gives it. I am the Lord of the Sabbath, is what Jesus said. I am the master of this rest. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's right. Let's go to Zechariah 4. So we are exiled from Babylon, and we need to rebuild the temple. 444 BC, the book of Nehemiah, if you've heard of the scribe Ezra or the Persian governor Zerubbabel, who is Jewish by blood. These characters enter the story now. They're coming to rebuild the house of the Lord. And Zechariah now is prophesying. Uh, Jeremiah prophesied of the destruction and the tearing down. Zechariah prophesied of the construction and the building up. Same with Haggai. There was a pause in building. It was a great faith issue because not everyone is kind of like a uh, president. He wants to get stuff done, and not everyone's on the same page, so it's, it, it could be a struggle, and things can just lay dead in the water, as they call it, and not move forward at all. Well, something like that was happening. So God encouraged him, uh, and I'll, I'll just read this out of chapter 4. The angel who talked with me again woke me like a man who's woken out of his sleep and said to me, What do you see? And I said, I see, and behold, a lampstand of all gold and a bowl at the top of it, and there are olive trees by it. There are seven lips of each lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees, one on the right and one on the left. And I said to the angel, what are these, my Lord? And the angel said, you don't know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. And here's the famous word, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. And he shall bring forward the top stone, and amid he will shout grace, grace to it. So what's happening here, okay, is God, I mean, this is awesome. So first of all, Zerubbabel was the guy who wanted to rebuild the house of God. And it, there was all this confusion, delay, uh, disorder, and God basically says, Who are you before Zerubbabel, a mountain I will bring you down? In other words, the man or woman of God who appoints their life commands their soul, commissions themselves in obedience to God to build God's house, to do God's will, to let God go first and everything else can seek after it. God will move every mountain. He will level every path so that you will be able to march forward with these orders. Let's go on though a little bit before, again, Revelation is deeply unlocking this in a fulfillment. And some of these are, are dual uh, fulfillment scriptures, dual prophetic uh, scriptures. But look at what this says. 
Hallelujah. Uh, let, let's go to verse uh, 12. And the second time I, I answered the Lord and said, What are these two branches of the olive trees uh, which are besides me in the golden pipes of which the golden oil is poured out? He said to me, You don't know what these are? And he said, No, my Lord. And he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the earth. Okay. So when we are in Revelation, we see a golden lampstand with olive oil. Okay, this is the menorah. The golden menorah is being fueled by olive oil. And the two branches or the two olive trees are the end time witnesses. Now, there's a lot of theological possibilities. Most people say it was Enoch and Elijah. Why? Because they are the only two individuals who ever were spared from death. Okay, but... If you look at the signs and wonders that these two guys perform in Revelation, they are the signs and wonders that Elijah and Moses did. And to go a step further, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, there were two witnesses, one on his right, one on his left. One was Moses and one was Elijah. Okay, these olive branches. Now, what is an olive branch? It is an extension of the olive tree, something firm, able to last for thousands of years, immovable and only good. There is nothing bad that comes from the olive. You can't eat too many olives. You can't get sick from olives. Matter of fact, olives are such healing, uh, such a healing force, and they're part of the seven species of God for a reason, that an olive branch is an extension of the promise of God, an extension of the provision of God. An olive branch is an extension of the uh, providence of God, the power, the healing, and light, because it extends olives, which can be used for food, for blessing, for ingestion, for renewal, uh, for in, in, a, in a revival, in a sense that it, it that goodness is being because there's a seed in olive can reproduce and replenish the earth. Uh, but remember, from the olive comes the olive oil, which is light and power. Power. How does a king become inaugurated? The oil is poured out upon him. What did Jacob do when he laid his head down and he said, this is none other than the house of God? He poured out oil. What did we do to consecrate everything that was in the sanctuary, the tent of meeting, the tent of witness, the tabernacle, which became the tent of David, which became the temple of Solomon? We poured out olive oil on it. So these witnesses are going to be filled with light, filled with healing, filled with goodness. That is what should be said about you and I, a Christian, a branch. I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can bear no fruit. Uh, is it to say that in your life I should see light? Well, Jesus said, you're the light of the earth, you're the light of the world. Should I find fruit in your life? Yes, what fruit is that? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control? Absolutely. Uh, against such things, there is no law. There's a lot we could say about this, but let's go on. Let's go to Psalm 128.3. Psalm 1283. Now, these end-time witnesses, are they are just amazing. God is never without a witness. He always sends us out two by two to have uh, two witnesses that are filled with light and love and power and healing and wellness and goodness that remind us of the providence, the provision, the protection, and the, uh, the privilege of God. Yes, I could. What, what could I liken this on to? Well, an olive branch. Okay. Psalm 128 and verse 3, and it reads, your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your home, and your children will be like olive shoots around your table. What is an olive shoot? Remember, an olive shoot is something that is able to be uh, taken and grafted to bear fruit. A shoot is a new bud. Uh, a child, like that olive branch, rejoices because a new work is here to stay. Uh, an olive tree starts, but so far we can't find a stop because they are as old as our ability to measure. Uh, and right now we have, again, we have a whole garden, an olive garden of trees from the time of Jesus where he prayed, the Garden of Gethsemane. Let's go to Jeremiah eleven sixteen. Jeremiah eleven sixteen. Now, remember, anytime you're going to learn about the seven species, when God blessed the promised land permanently with seven species, uh, there, are, there are many other scriptures that are going to be unlocked circumspectly uh, through this. For an example, look at Jeremiah here in 1116. 
The Lord once called you a green olive tree, beautiful with good fruit. A uh, child, like an olive sheet around your table, what is that? It's beautiful with good fruit. Look at this wreath here, okay? This is beautiful. It is a beautiful wreath. The leaves have a, two tones of green. Uh, there's a, it's just a, a strong, secure, with gorgeous wood. I mean, this is really, uh, from God's perspective, it's beautiful and it's good. Remember that in our, in our culture, we exaggerate everything. Everything is totally awesome, extravagant, extravaganza, extraordinary. Okay, fine. Uh, in the Hebrew culture, you don't really embellish things. If you really want to go to the next level, you'll say it twice. I'll give you an example. Jesus said, verily, verily, which means truly, truly. Uh, God is the most holy that ever was. How do you come into alignment with this, with the Hebrew vernacular, Hebrew culture? Say it three times. Holy, holy, holy. That is the highest level of something to the third power. Um, but just know that olives are good. And when something is good in God, in our culture, you would use a lot of words to describe that. Something that is only good, only healing, only secure. Uh, something that is this good should be found in your pantry. Amen? If you are a man or a woman and you believe in God, adopt this into your life. Adopt what God says is good, whether it's olives, whether it is an honest friend, whether it's a time of prayer, time of devotion, whether it is an act of mercy. If God calls it good, perhaps you should consider embracing it in your life. Okay, let's go to Matthew 25. Okay, we're going to... We're going to examine a parable from the master. Now, uh, this in this case, it is very important that we view olive oil as something more than food, even though, hey, awesome, right? No complaints here. Uh, have you ever taken bread and dipped it in the herbs and the olive oil in an Italian restaurant with a little balsamic vinegar? I mean, that's high speed. Uh, but there's a greater application to our understanding of what olive oil is. It's not just a cooking agent. And it's not just for light. Uh, it actually is for life. And I'll, let's, let's get into this parable here. Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins. Okay. Before I tell you this parable, we need to know just a couple things about Jewish culture. When you get married, well, here's what happens. Uh, a guy will go knock on the, the door of the, of the bride. And he will basically ask her hand in marriage. If, he, if, if he's successful, in other words, she says yes, then he says, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, this language is very familiar in the New Testament concerning the church and Jesus Christ. Uh, I go to prepare a place for you. So he goes, and this is factual in culture. He would leave for one year's time. This is during the engagement. And he would build a house for her, for her and him to dwell in. It had to be equal to or greater than her father's house. Uh, because the bridegroom was supposed to be worthy. He was supposed to be a continuum, if you will, of the father uh, and a worthy man. And so what's happening is when he goes, his friends go with him. Perhaps they sing songs and stuff. Uh, but when he returns a year later, now by this time, she, she should have only been beautifying herself and tying up loose ends to get ready for when he comes uh, in the middle of the night, and he will do that. In the beginning, he comes, it's all announced um, to his friends. He goes there and finds her kind of in secret. But in, when he comes uh, later, there's a great procession with him. Now you have the bridesmaids and the bridegrooms, and they have lamps with oil because they need to go through the night to uh, their meal, to place of uh, festivity, a place of reconciliation, a place of covenant reconciling their self to God's will permanently. No oil, you can't see. Now you're not valuable to the party because we need the light. So olive oil is going to be used for light, like it is the menorah. Let's read this. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Okay, Five of them were foolish, but five wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, 
Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. And all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. That's the wick that's in the lamp. And uh, the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise said, Since there's not enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut afterward. And by the way, marriage feasts are like seven days. If you, if you go in and the door closes, that's it. There's no knocking on the door. When the bridegroom knocks on your door, you come out and you follow him, and then you go into the bridal chamber. This is for seven days. Um, and if you miss the bus, you miss the bus. So what happens here? The wise said, uh, there's not enough for you and I. Go buy them. They went to go buy them. They missed the bridegroom. Afterward, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, open the door for us. But he said, I truly, truly do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you do not know neither the day or the hour. Now, this is a plug. It's called an, you could call it an eschatological plug. It's when a end times uh, or last, end, eschatological is the study of last events or end events. Um, about the return of Jesus. And he's, based, he's our bridegroom, we're his bride. Uh, we become one, the church in our Christ. Um, when he comes back to receive us, we need to be ready. Um, now, olive oil in this context is literal. This will light your lamp. Uh, imagine like a little Gideon lamp or first century clay lamp. Uh, but no olive oil, no light. Now, uh, what if you went to a banquet uh, or wherever and the power was out you couldn't do anything matter of fact when it's daytime and there's power no power okay fine we'll go outside at night when the power goes out there's nothing you can do you sit there and i'll tell you what one thing that's hard about this which is why we need to maintain our uh first century culture listen to this uh in in our culture we used to make fires you know in the in the living room and the outside. We do make fire to cook, not just marshmallows. That's like a camping thing because it's not necessary, but it used to be necessary. Well, then we got gas stoves and electric stoves, and now really, really, unless they have a fireplace for like comfort or pleasure, nobody has this application anymore in their house for the most part. If you have a house that was built in the 1800s, it still may have a uh, heating system that's derived from a fire and, and good ducts, but um, ultimately it's no longer necessary. Well, when we were in that transition, in other words, we had a, a fireplace for 50 years and now we have an oven on the other side of the house and we use that, but if that ever goes down and we use the fire, fine. But we are so detached from this that we are digital everything, LED everything, that if our power goes out, we don't just go light a fire, we're like we're stuck and we're so used to the electricity we kind of get paralyzed so if you're one of those older people that were born in the you know 40s 50s and 60s you should have candles emergency lights and lamps of course some of the end time buffs are really uh, preparing their churches in ways like this as well canned goods and stuff like it used to be um, but other than that no light no service you can't operate literally if you ever wait till it's dark out go in your house when it's, you know, 10, 11, 12 at night, go in your house and turn off the light. You cannot, you literally can't see your hand in front of your face. That's how important the light is. I've never met anyone who goes home at night and doesn't turn on the lights as the very first thing they've done uh, or that they need to do. So in this example, Jesus is saying that if you have oil and you're ready for him, you will receive him. You'll go to the wedding of the lamb and you will, you know, everything that's there will be there with you as well. Uh, if you run out of oil or you don't manage your oil correctly and you have to go get more because you need it, you can't get in without it, but if you go get it when he comes, in other words, if you don't have it when you need it, it's checkmate. So what does this oil really represent? Is it goodness in the human soul like the witnesses? Is it a word of power in season and out of season? Uh, is this olive oil representing the promises of God? Uh, is it grafting, which means it's you and I? If we've been grafted into the tree of Israel, does that mean I'm the vine and you're the branches? Is that what it really means? Yes, all of the above. The question I have for you is, are you a branch that's fully grafted in?
Because if you're not, you can't bear fruit. If you're fully grafted into the tree, the tree is the Lord, I am the vine, you are the branches, you can produce much fruit. And that fruit can be for light, for insight, for revelation, for hope, for healing. There's so much to say about olives. Uh, but what we need to say is thank you, Lord, for giving us such a thoughtful gift to enrich our lives. We use its fruit, we use its oil, we use its wood, we use its leaves for many things. Amen.